thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, two very small uh, corrigenda uh, due to the um, uh, COVID um, period, no doubt. Um, the CV is slightly out of date in the sense that I've uh, retired as a, a chair of the ILA and conduct committee. But um, otherwise, uh, it's a delight to be here and um, to welcome Dr. Justice um, Chandra Chud, uh, who is um, a judge of the Supreme Court of India at the moment, but um, is due um, in accordance with the Indian practice uh, of seniority, uh, but um, eminently well deservedly to become Chief Justice in the first week of November. And I think he will have a, an unusually long period in office, which is of importance in the Indian context where there's much to do and uh, which uh, his um, CV shows that he is um, playing a strong part in doing. I'll come back to that. Uh, he um, was, before his appointment to the Supreme Court, um, which took place in May 2016, the Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court uh, for three years. And before that, he had been a judge of the Bombay um, High Court, as I suppose. Um, does one call it that? It's still the Bombay High still. Court. Still. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that, um, for 13 years, March 2000 to October 2013. Uh, I knew Kings would be up to date and accurate on that. <laughs> uh, Justice Chandrajo joined the Bombay Bar um, after he had obtained an LMM and a doctorate uh, of juridical science from Harvard Law School. And he was designated a, a senior advocate in June 1998 and served as additional Solicitor General of India. And as an advocate, he championed a number of causes which are dear to his heart, such as the right to privacy, the rights of HIV, plus workers and religious and linguistic minority rights. And during that um, period as a lawyer, he was also a visiting professor of uh, comparative constitutional law at the University of Bombay. As a judge of the Supreme Court, he's also um, continued very active in the same fields, delivering seminal judgments, including um, dissenting judgments, some notable dissents upholding the values of liberty and freedom, um, judgments on the decriminalization of homosexuality or, and of adultery, privacy as a fundamental right, disabilities, combating caste and gender discrimination, as well as environmental law. I come back to the area where, uh, certainly from uh, my wife's and my visits to India, uh, progress might well be made, um, having seen them. Uh, the piles uh, stored uh, in uh, some courts or in the, in the vicinities of courts as well as elsewhere. Um, it, Justice Chandragood is the chairperson of the E-Committee of the Supreme Court of India. Uh, he is spearheading a digital transformation of the judicial system in India, which, as you know, constitutes many thousands of courts um, to ensure access, transparency, and accountability. And he set up virtual calls, courts and enabled video conferencing of court hearings and um, has also facilitated the digitalization of court records and the e-filing of cases. I imagine that's an incentive which, as in every area in which we're engaged, um, um, has uh, received an enormous input, uh, impetus in the time of COVID. Um, we've all got to learn how feasible it is to work uh, off um, digital um, uh, uh, material um, rather than print material and also um, virtually and how uh, fruitful that can be um, even um, uh, well at every level in the court system. The national judicial data grid um, which um, is obviously central to this current work is the repository of all decided and pending cases and judgments and will pave the way um, even to using artificial intelligence in case management and deployment of resources. Now, before coming here to speak to us today, Justice Chandragood has uh, obviously guest spoken all over the world, Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, Australian National University, and the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. So working up to the um, culminus or peak of uh, uh, achievements to speak to kings uh, in London. Uh, uh, and we, we look forward to it very much. He's also, of course, addressed a large number of international conferences, including United Nations conferences and World Bank conferences. Um, but we very much look forward to hearing what you've got to say, Dr. Chandler. Thanks for coming.
you very much, Lord Lance, for such a warm introduction and uh, good morning. I'm delighted to be speaking at the King's College and I wish to thank at the outset the Dixon Poon School of Law, King's India Institute, and the Jindal Global Law School for organizing this event. I was reading a book uh, which was published in 2016, which is titled Engaging the World, Indian Foreign Policy Since 1947. And there's a chapter in the book by Andrew Wyatt, which is titled India and the United Kingdom, Finding a New Equilibrium. And that chapter describes the relationship between India and the UK as a relationship which has been very often called an unusual relationship. And for reason, the legacy of the empire and the struggle for freedom form an important part of our history in India. Yet the last 75 years have been witness to the two nations being drawn close in diverse areas of human endeavor. Today, the relationship is based on a shared history, a jurisprudential tradition founded on the common law, ties of friendship and family, culture and entertainment, and now, in a globalized world, the seamless flow of business and capital and trade. The two countries have much in common, a parliamentary democracy, the common use of the English language, the presence of a significant Indian diaspora in the UK, which connects us politically, socially, and culturally. Indian students, I see so many of you today, studying in the UK have contributed to creating a shared culture of knowledge and values. There's also a growing economic dialogue and strategic cooperation between the two countries. Many individual rights have originated in the common law, which then have become universal. India and the UK have created a robust legal framework for the protection of human rights. The central theme of my presentation this morning is that rights in themselves are paper tigers unless they are given teeth by the court and unless there is a continuing engagement of citizens with the Constitution and the rights framework. In today's lecture, I would be discussing how the courts in India have played a role in protecting human rights and preserving civil liberties, obviously focusing on a few key areas. Some might say I've been partial because these are areas close to my heart. In the process, I will highlight how the Indian Supreme Court has interacted with the global community of judges and has influenced or has been influenced by work across national boundaries. As Justice Aaron Barak, the distinguished former judge of the Israeli Supreme Court said, the purpose of comparison is inspiration. One may ask, what is the relevance of a global judicial dialogue on human rights? Why is it at all necessary to look at international judicial trends while examining issues of human rights in one's own country? A possible answer, and I'm not sure as a judge that I have answers to all the vexed problems that we uh, would discuss today, is that typically human rights are characterized as inherent and universal. An individual possesses human rights by virtue of being a human being. This definition of human rights often finds its source in natural law, which can be a reference to God, reason, the universe, or any other transcendental source. Human rights are universal because they are natural. The invocation of human rights in this conception is not contingent on their recognition by state legislation. Courts also tend to protect certain outside rights or unenumerated rights, which may not be explicitly stated in a statute. One of the key areas of dispute in our jurisprudence has been as to whether, in the course of an emergency, the right to life would stand suspended. <coughs> the constitutional position has changed after the emergency of 1975, but our court took the view in 1975, 
that when the right to life stands suspended during the course of a national emergency, the right of access to the courts also would stand suspended. We overruled that judgment while deciding the privacy issue by holding that the right to life is recognized by the Constitution, but it does not owe its existence to the Constitution. And therefore, there is a sense of the right to life or personal liberty being universal, which finds recognition in the more recent jurisprudential trends in India. The origin of human rights was not restricted to one geographical reason or region or legal system or a country. Human rights developed in different parts of the world with reference to religion, maybe ancient customs, traditions and cultures. Perhaps the earliest reference to human rights was found in the Cyprus Cylinder, which details an account of the conquest of Babylon by Cyprus in 539 BCE and provides for religious tolerance, freedom of movement, and for racial and linguistic equality. In the East, the beginnings of human rights are traced to the Sanskrit treatise called the Arthashastra, written in the 4th and the early 3rd century, which spoke of promoting justice, creation of a just penal system, the equal protection of law regardless of caste or political belief, and the like. In the West, the emergence of human rights is traced to the Magna Carta, the 1689 English Bill of Rights, and a defining moment in our history was a declaration of the French Revolution in 1789, which reinforced the concept of human rights as being natural and alienable, inalienable. Developed in the aftermath of the Second World War, the modern conception of human rights has ushered in the age of rights. The moral transgressions during the war shocked the conscience of the world, leading to the adoption of the Universal Declaration. This history of human rights, however, failed to recognize the anti-colonial struggles and the atrocities which were suffered by the people of the global south. As Professor Samuel Moyne suggests in his book, The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, it is only in the 1970s that human rights became a common vocabulary and people from around the world learned to speak its language. The decades between the 1940s and the 1970s witnessed the decolonization of a majority of nations in the world and new constitutions based on anti-colonial freedom struggles and the principle of self-determination and self-governance were adopted. Adopted on the 26th of January 1950 and regarded as the lengthiest constitution in the world, the Indian constitution was a product of these societal realities and struggles. The drafters of the Indian constitution did not envision it only as a document governing or witnessing the transfer of political power. The constitution is a transformative document which attempts to remedy the discrimination grounded in caste and patriarchy in our society. Part three of our constitution details the fundamental rights which inure to the benefit of every person or citizen of the country, depending on the nature of rights, including the right to equality, free speech and expression, life and liberty, and religion. However, these rights were not absolute or free from intervention by the state. The burden that lay on future generations <coughs> was to transform society and to rid it from the shackles of caste, class, and patriarchy, none of which would have been possible without the intervention in these individual liberties. For instance, the practice of free religion would have included the abhorrent practices of sati, the burning of a widow on the funeral pyre of her husband, or Devdasis, which were not in consonance with the idea of a truly free India. The complete right to equality, without providing for affirmative action, would have ignored the economic and social conditions in which these rights exist, <coughs> which necessarily benefit the upper class. 
the unrestricted right to the freedom of speech and expression could lead to public disorder, would be consistent with hate speech, which would have been a death knell to a fragile, new, and divided country that India was at the birth of the new nation. The history of human rights protection in India has been centered around Articles 14, 19, and 21, and their interpretation by the Supreme Court. During the drafting of the Constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the chairperson of the drafting committee, reposed faith in constitutional courts across the country. He proclaimed that Article 32, which is the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which defines the right to seek constitutional remedies and the enforcement of fundamental rights, constitute the soul of our Constitution, without which the Constitution would be a writ in sand. In its long history as an independent nation, the Supreme Court has often been central to the realization of constitutional goals and values and the protection of the rights and liberties of citizens. Due to its position in the Constitution, not merely as a constitutional court, but as an appellate court of last resort, and the breadth of its power under Article 142 to do complete justice, those are the words. The task of adjudication is challenging. How has the Supreme Court responded to it? It is almost a cliche to say that Supreme Courts, even in democratic nations governed by the rule of law, are not final because they are right, but they are right simply because they are final. Judges are not infallible. <clears throat> Decisions once thought to be final are viewed by, by successive generations. However, would the country's social, political, and economic status have been the same but for the intervention of the Supreme Court? The debate in individual cases aside, the answer to the question is in the negative. I will now briefly deal with the role of the Supreme Court in conceptualizing civil rights in recent years. In realizing the true potential of civil liberties under the Constitution, one of the most important conversations or dialogues that the Supreme Court has engaged in has been around gender. In the decades after independence, the focus both of the judiciary and of parliament was to ensure the protection of the economic interests of women and to ed eradicate societal practices that led to manifest discrimination. Instances of these include the amendments to succession laws in India, particularly the Hindu Succession Act, the development of jurisprudence pertaining to Section 125 of the Code of Criminal Procedure for granting maintenance to a woman who has been deserted by her spouse, the enhancement of criminal laws to target societal practices such as dowry, domestic violence, and female infanticide. With the changing times, however, the Supreme Court has attempted to move beyond these manifest forms of discrimination and has engaged with the binary division of gender into men and women, gendered notions of certain professions, and discrimination based on gender in the workplace, within the confines of homes, or in society, among others. For instance, in a case called Anuj Garg versus Hotel Association of India, the court heard a challenge to the provisions of the Punjab Excise Act of 1914 which prohibited men under the age of 25 and any woman in premises in which liquor or drugs were consumed. The provision sought to create a distinction between the two genders based on cultural norms and stereotypes. The court allowed the challenge and upheld the right to privacy, which grants autonomy to a person to choose their own profession. We have had similar issues where there have been challenges to prohibitions on quote-unquote bar girls conducting their livelihood in all men bars. 
I have heard similar arguments when I was presiding over a batch of petitions concerning the denial of permanent commissions to women officers in the armed forces in Babita Punia versus Secretary in the Ministry of Defense. The challenge before the court was raised by women officers from the armed forces who were employed for a limited tenure of up to 10 years and were not granted permanent commissions as opposed to their male counterparts. Arguments such as women officers have to deal with pregnancy, motherhood, and domestic obligations, which are not well suited for the life of a soldier, or that there are physiological limitations on women officers, and that the environment in areas where the armed forces operate are not suitable for a woman, were advanced to deny the grant of permanent commission, which were ultimately rejected by the Supreme Court. One of the arguments was that the Russian warships, which were deployed in large numbers by the Indian Navy, did not have toilets which were separate for women. And we rejected those arguments. Recently, the Supreme Court has issued directions for the protection of sex workers who are adults and participating in the profession with consent separating the need for protecting women from illegal trafficking from respecting the choice of women to voluntarily engage in the profession. Instances of protective discrimination which either assume that women are incapable of performing certain professions or to decide that such professions pose a security risk to women originate in deep-seated patriarchal mindsets that views men as the normal and any deviation as the exception. To paraphrase one of my icons, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when the government or the society obstructs the choice of profession of women under the garb of protection, the woman is being treated as less than a full adult human responsible for her own choices. The outlook then focuses not on transforming or fostering a social environment where all citizens flourish, but instead on modifying the environment to a particular section of the society. For instance, we had provisions in the Factories Act in India which prohibited the employment of women in the hours of the night so that a woman could not work in a factory, irrespective of the conditions of work, because the hours were late hours. The Supreme Court has realized that it is not merely enough that women are granted the opportunity <coughs> to sit on the same table in a workplace, but also to ensure that their lived experiences are factored in to ensure that they can avail of these substantive opportunities. Very often, social barriers, and conditions that only impact a particular section of the society are overlooked. For instance, in a follow-up to the armed forces judgment in Lieutenant Colonel Nitisha versus Union of India, the policy that the government had formulated to assess the eligibility of women officers for the grant of permanent commissions in the army, following our earlier verdict, was in challenge. The policy of the government imposed, among others, on women in their 40s or their late 40s, the same physical evaluation criteria that a male officer would have to pass a decade or two earlier to get permanent commission for female officers. And the contention before us was very simple. Most of these women officers said that we were what they called SHAPE-1. SHAPE does not stand for your physical shape, but it's an acronym for a variety of features, including your psych psychiatric evaluation. And they said we were in SHAPE-1 when our male officers were considered for the grant of permanent commission. But if you apply to us those standards today, when most of us are now have faced the rigors of a full life in the armed forces, that would be inherently unfair. Therefore, the issue at hand was that while for male officers that assessment was done when they were within the age of 25 to 30, these women officers who had been denied permanent commission were to be evaluated at the age of 45. 
the bench of which I was a part declared the evaluation criteria to be arbitrary and, and irrational and causing systemic discrimination as it disproportionately impacted them as against their male counterparts. The court, while rendering the above decision, analyzed the concepts of direct and indirect discrimination. The court noted that in the UK, the fault lines that separates direct discrimination from indirect discrimination is not the intent of the discriminator, but the fact that direct discrimination cannot be justified in any circumstance, while indirect discrimination is susceptible to justification. Our court held that the absence of an intent to exclude women from the grant of permanent commission is irrelevant under an indirect discrimination analysis and the court has to look at the effect of the criterion, not at the intent underlying its adoption. In light of the fact that the pattern of evaluation would exclude women from the grant of permanent commission on grounds beyond their control, <coughs> we held that the criteria indirectly discriminated against women officers. Well, there's a sting in the tail after all this. We laid down the law, but we found that almost 700 women officers had been denied commission, applying our judgment. And we had all these women officers who came back to the Supreme Court. And we had to apply ourselves on a case-by-case -case basis to see whether the denial of, uh, the denial of uh, permanent commissions to these women was justified. The government itself and the armed forces, I must tell you, were extremely receptive once the judgment came. They engaged with the court. And close to 600 women, as a result, got permanent commissions in the, in the armed forces. So very often, it's not enough for a court adjudicating upon human rights to merely lay down doctrine, but to ensure that the benefits of doctrine do reach out to common citizens, even if it means that you have to spend a little more time in an already overloaded backlog of cases. Another issue that the Supreme Court has focused on is that of intersectional discrimination where many factors, including gender, caste, and disability, play a role in the commission of heinous offenses on, say, a visually challenged woman belonging to the scheduled castes. Uh, in this case, a, a woman who was raped. She was blind at birth. She belonged to the Dalit community. Of course, she was a woman. And she was subject to gender violence. So in this judgment in Patan Jamal Wali, versus the state of Andhra Pradesh, the court stressed that the factors causing intersectional discrimination must be assessed while determining the sentence of a convict. These factors do not operate in isolation and are deeply embedded in our society. The only possible way of creating a more inclusive society is to recognize these causes of discrimination through our judicial work as judges and even in our daily lives. The struggles of the LGBTQ community have similarly found a voice in our courts. The members of the LGBTQ community have lived, thrived, endured, and loved through the beginning of time. In the face of stigma and practice and prejudice, many have been forced to live their lives closeted from the straight society. In turn, they have created their own communities, found liberation and solidarity, as they have together resisted the heteronormative order and have crafted their own language of being when the labels that the society gave them fell short of the diversity that they had to offer to the world. LGBTQ liberation movements are gaining, movement, are gaining traction and momentum <coughs> today in India and have achieved certain legal milestones that I will be discussing very briefly. The first significant case that advanced the rights of the LGBTQ community was National Legal Services Authority versus the Union of India. The judgment of our court detailed the deep cultural, societal, and religious recognition given to transgender persons in India. It recognized the different kinds of communities of transgender persons in India and the suffering they had witnessed in recounting the discrimination faced by transgender persons, the court held that non-recognition 
of the true identity of transgenders has led to the exacerbation of the social stigma that they have faced. This made them vulnerable to exploitation and hindered their access to public places, employment opportunities, and placed a bar on their freedom of expression. Such a life without dignity struck at the heart of the fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution. The judgment in Nalsa also surveyed the comparative law in question to ground India's understanding of recognizing gender identity. In doing so, it reviewed the Yogyakarta principles in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity, jurisprudence of the courts in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, and the European Court of Human Rights. It surveyed legislation in countries such as Australia, South Africa, Argentina, and Germany. Benefiting from this comparative analysis, the court adopted the principle of a psychological <laughs> test rather than a biological test to determine the identity of a person as a transgender. In terms of the relief, the Supreme Court used its powers to give detailed instructions to government to recognize persons apart from binary genders as a third gender and to allow transgenders to self-identify their genders amongst others. The identification of a specific gender identity was not premised it was not premised on the requirement of having any sort of medical intervention. And that, I think, is crucial to the whole debate. Following Nalsa, the high courts in India have rendered decisions granting protection to transgender persons and giving specific directions to state authorities for reservation and public employment and educational institutions for them. <coughs> They've upheld self-identification of transgender persons in individual cases and recognized a marriage between a man and a trans woman as a valid marriage under the Hindu Marriage Act. On 6 September 2018, a long drawn court battle to decriminalize consensual sex between persons of the same sex culminated in the Indian Supreme Court in Navte Johar versus the Union of India. The court did not limit itself to reading down a colonial era penal provision, section 377, which made it a penal offense to engage in sexual intercourse against, in carnal intercourse, against the order of nature. Those are the words. So the court did not limit itself to reading down the, the penal provision, section 377, removing the prohibition on engaging in certain consensual sexual acts, but also provided an expansive affirmation of the rights of LGBT individuals. While section 377 was neutrally worded, symbolically by criminalizing unnatural sex, it pathologized and created negative social identities of LGBT persons. In terms of material harm, section 377 became a tool of harassment, extortion, extrajudicial arrest, detention, and violence against queer individuals by the police. Though all queer persons were vulnerable to such harms, working class transgender persons and gay men who did not conform to a masculine presentation of their gender in public were especially targeted. In my opinion in Napte Johar, I invoke the principle of indirect discrimination to argue that although section 377 is neutrally worded, its effect and operation infringes the fundamental rights of the members of the LGBTQ community. Article 15 of the Constitution prohibits discrimination on the grounds of sex. Section 377 is premised on stereotypes about men and women, which results in unequal treatment on the ground of sex. As I note, statutes like Section 377 give people ammunition to say, this is what a man is, by giving them a law which says, this is what a man is not. Thus, laws that affect non-heterosexuals rest upon a normative stereotype, the bald conviction that certain behavior, for example, sex with women is appropriate for members of one sex, but not for members of the other sex. 
The rights of LGBTQ persons cannot be restricted to private spaces. I note in my opinion that the right to sexual privacy, founded on the right to autonomy of a free individual, must capture the right of persons of the community to navigate public spaces on their own terms, free from state interference. Hence, it is imperative to cast the right to privacy in terms of decisional autonomy rather than a narrow conception of spatial privacy. In decriminalizing same-sex intercourse, the Indian Supreme Court also referred to several European community decisions, including Dudgeon versus United Kingdom in 1981, Norris versus Ireland in 1983, and Modernus versus Cyprus of 1993, in which provisions similar to Section 377 were found to be violative of Article 8 of the European Human Rights Convention that seeks to protect the right of privacy of a person. The Indian Supreme Court also referred to the Wolfenden Report of 1957, which proposed that there must remain a realm of private morality and immorality and recommended that homosexual acts between two consenting adults should no longer be a criminal offence. The court noted specifically that on the basis of this report, important legislation was enacted in the United Kingdom, such as the Sexual Offences Act of 1967, which abolished penal offences involving <coughs> consenting same-sex adults, and the Policing and Crimes Act of 2017, which pardoned persons who were cautioned or convicted under legislation that prohibited homosexual acts. In 2019, the Botswana High Court declared a law criminalizing same-sex relations as unconstitutional, relying heavily on our judgment in Nafte Johar. It is also encouraging to note that Indian High Courts, post the decision in Nafte Johar, has started recognizing romantic relationships between queer women and granting them protection, sometimes against their own parents. This has been possible because of the expansive conception of rights in the judgment. In recent years, the Indian Supreme Court's jurisprudence has also advanced in the field of disability law. At the legislative level, efforts had already been made to ensure that persons with disability are not subjected to discrimination with the introduction of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act. In Vikas Kumar versus the Union Public Service Commission, the Indian Supreme Court held that an individual suffering from a writer's cramp is entitled to, to the provision of a scribe for appearing in the civil services examination. The court held that the denial of a scribe on the basis that the petitioner did not have a benchmark disability of 40% or more violated the provisions of the law since every person with a disability is entitled to reasonable accommodation. <coughs> the court recognizes that the principle of reasonable accommodation is at the heart of the values of substantive equality and human dignity recognized by the Constitution. So we have really placed the provisions of the statute, namely reasonable accommodation, not merely as a matter of statutory interpretation, but in a constitutional perspective giving it a sense of permanence in the, in the societal firmament. Writing the judgment of the court, I emphasize that when competent persons with disabilities are unable to realize their full potential due to the barriers posed in their path, our society suffers as much, if not more, as do the disabled people involved. In their blooming and blossoming, we all bloom and blossom. The court relied on the United Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which interestingly refers to the phrase dignity on 22 occasions. In a recent judgment in 2021, which is Ravindra Kumar Dhariwal, our Supreme Court addressed workplace discrimination against persons suffering from mental health conditions. In that case, an officer of the Central Paramilitary Forces was diagnosed with OCD and secondary major depression and was found to have 40 to 70 percent mental disability. He was dismissed from service. In a judgment authored by me again, the Supreme Court held that initiation of disciplinary proceedings against the officer 
was indirectly discriminatory because persons with mental disability are at a disproportionate disadvantage of being subjected to such proceedings in comparison with their able-bodied counterparts. We held that while all paramilitary personnel may be subject to disciplinary proceedings on charges of misconduct, the appellant was more vulnerable to engage in behavior that would be classified as misconduct because of his disability. As a relief, we directed that the officer be reasonably accommodated and be given a suitable alternative post where he did not have to wield firearms. Cases such as this give us an insight into how discrimination may stem from a number of factors and is fluid. Having spoken about the role of the Indian Supreme Court in ensuring protection of marginalized communities, there is one more group whose rights must be considered, deliberated upon and noticed, that of convicts who have been granted death penalty sentences. The constitutionality of capital punishment was upheld by the Supreme Court in Bachan Singh versus State of Punjab, applying at the same time the rarest of rare cases standards, which is that the death penalty shall be imposed only in rarest of rare cases. Applying the rarest of rare cases standard, the court had also given broad guidelines or indicators for sentencing, which account for aggravating and mitigating factors while cautioning that this assessment must account for the dignity of human life. These principles have further been evolved in cases where the court has broadly categorized five heads of sentencing. Through the years, however, there has been concern over non-uniform, inconsistent sentencing, which has permeated to the district courts and the high courts. Recently, the Supreme Court has recognized the need of ensuring that mitigating circumstances are considered at the trial stage itself, such that proper evaluation of the progress of the accused and their mental state, family background, and education can be conducted to arrive at an appropriate sentence. The need for a uniform pattern of sentencing while accounting for various psychological, social, and biological factors is necessary to ensure that criminal law does not appear in its application to be inconsistent and a game of chance. A very crucial procedural intervention by the Supreme Court is now to ensure that every review petition in a death penalty case is heard in open court by a bench of at least three judges. Reviews in the Indian Supreme Court are disposed of by circulation, by the judges discussing the case in chambers. Our court ruled that a review in a death penalty case has to be heard in open court. And some of the results which we have seen as a consequence have been startling, if only satisfying for the judge delivering the verdict. For instance, I had a case where an accused had been sentenced to death. When the review came up and we asked the counsel for the accused as to whether they were pressing for commuting the sentence of death to a sentence of imprisonment for life, counsel said, well, I understand that I'm in review, but if you give me the rest of the afternoon, I'll not only persuade you to the belief that this is a case for commuting the sentence of death to life imprisonment, but I'll persuade you to hold that this is a case for a clean acquittal, and we have quitted the accused. So some of these procedural interventions, I must also emphasize the continuing engagement of groups of citizens with the Indian Supreme Court. Uh, we have the academia. We have very significant involvement of the academia with the Supreme Court. Uh, the academia has been uh, persuading the Supreme Court to ensure that a psychological evaluation of a death row convict is carried out so as to enable the court to assess as to whether the mental health of the uh, convict is such that it would be justified, even if you uphold the death penalty, to execute the death penalty? Or would it be contrary to the principles underlying Article 21, which protects life and personal liberty? All these instances and more show the path that the Supreme Court has taken to protect human rights and civil liberties for different segments of society in a democracy. The role of courts in a democracy 
is of course informed by the civil and political structure, the social fabric, and to a certain extent the customs and traditions in society. Very often, however, the Supreme Court is thought of as the first line of defense or the one-stop solution to resolve complicated issues of policy and society. The use of the court as the first line of defense to solve complicated social issues may be a reflection of the waning power of discourse and consensus building in society. If we allow our local laws, institutions, and practices to be co-opted by the forces of racism, casteism, and discrimination, all our social problems will have to be taken out of deliberative fora and placed before the court. Our ever-expanding list of rights risks trivializing the essential core of rights without really advancing the important social issues that we have reconceptualized as rights. The growing litigious trend in the country is indicative of the lack of patience in the political discourse. This results in a slippery slope where courts are regarded as the only organ for the state in the realization of rights, obviating the need for a continuous engagement with the legislature and the executive. It is true that the Supreme Court of India has to protect the fundamental rights of persons and to perform its constitutional duty. However, it's important to realize that the Supreme Court cannot and must not transcend its role by deciding issues requiring the involvement of a broad-based consensus amongst elected representatives. That would only be a deviation from its constitutional role, but would not serve a democratic society, which at its core must resolve issues through public deliberation, discourse, and the engagement of citizens with their representatives and the Constitution. It is really in the continuing engagement of citizens with the Constitution in their daily lives that human rights, in that sense, can secure a firm foundation with the assistance of the courts. But refining our rights rhetoric to include participative processes as well as substantive outcomes is one step towards recognizing the complementarity or the complementary roles which the political and the legal spheres of the Constitution play in protecting our human rights. In other words, the fulfillment of the ideals of the Constitution and the protections guaranteed under it cannot only be achieved by exercising our role as citizens once every five years when we cast the ballot. There must, in other words, be a continuous engagement of citizens, not just with the courts, but with all pillars of a democratic order. I think with that, I'm through with my <laughs> presentation. Justice Chandra Chud, thank you for an immensely rich and wide-ranging talk, um, fascinating at every level and um, reminding us of what we have in common, um, what we're so lucky to be able to share, as you described, um, ultimately uh, a conception, a mutual conception of natural justice and individual rights. Um, and I think um, at the very end, uh, you um, turned, I think, to the extraordinarily important, and in, in this country too, very relevant question as to um, uh, whose responsibility uh, is it and uh, how uh, should um, society uh, recognize human rights. Um, the courts have a, an absolutely core role, but as you said, um, in a democratic society, uh, 
one hopes and wishes sufficient coherence and cohesion for uh, important decisions to be made uh, through discourse and um, either agreement or parliamentary uh, legislative decision um, which the courts will implement uh, the um, balance um, when that is not the situation, the extent to which the courts can act as a substitute um, is um, a, an extraordinarily interesting subject and um, one where our own jurisprudence has um, varied recently. I won't go into it, but um, uh, certainly some of the um, uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence uh, of, of our court is highly relevant here. Uh, ultimately, of course, um, the recognition of um, common or natural rights uh, does depend upon a view of the relationship between the state and the individual, which um, sadly is not perhaps um, shared everywhere in the world. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, increasing uh, prevalence uh, in parts of the world of a view that um, ultimately what matters is state interests, uh, uh, which state is entitled to enforce rather than uh, uh, individual interests which the state um, is designed to serve, uh, that view is un unfortunately one which um, has considerable prevalence and it ultimately results in um, us um, uh, or society uh, not being governed by uh, the rule of law but um, being governed by law which is imposed from above. But um, I think our common heritage has uh, ensured that uh, that is not the position uh, of course, we don't have your written constitution, which, as you described, is so immensely important as the instrument which you uh, have to construe. Um, and um, we do have, of course, court independence, and we do, of course, uh, have as a fundamental principle the rule of law. Dicey put them side by side. But um, again, in this country, there are interesting debates um, which have a quite current relevance uh, as to um, what happens in circumstances where uh, there is no written constitution and parliamentary sovereignty, in theory at least, entitles um, um, the legislature to um, uh, override. Um, at the moment, um, we've, um, we have no longer um, any um, backstop in the European Union, uh, whether that was good or bad. Um, we do have the Human Rights Convention as a backstop, and it is domestically enforceable, but that is a subject of um, current discussion, um, at least in some quarters, as to whether there should be some modification of that um, um, relationship. Um, you've um, spoken very powerfully of particular areas of um, um, transformation brought about by court decision. Uh, you mentioned um, um, the argument, which clearly um, uh, can't or couldn't and doesn't prevail, that um, freedom of religion could um, require, uh, include um, a right to insist on sati. Uh, I, I used to enjoy when I uh, was um, sitting in the Privy Council uh, um, looking at, actually it was in my room for a long period, the old 1830 volume of the Privy Council uh, reports, um, which had all the arguments in the great Satie case, which came to the Privy Council uh, then, uh, following, um, I, I think, a, a bold proclamation by the uh, governor um, in um, Kolkata or Calcutta, uh, abolishing Satie. And um, it, it, it came up and was argued um, vigorously um, by the, uh, uh, I think, Hindu society that this was something which uh, it was entitled to um, uh, continue um, to perform. Uh, if you look at the constitution of the Privy Council, you might r rather doubt whether uh, the Privy Council was entirely um, composed in accordance with our conceptions of natural justice. Among those sitting on it was the Marquis Wellesley, who was the Duke of Wellington's brother, who had uh, fought a number of uh, wars down in South India 20, 30 years before. And there were one or two other appointees who, it struck me, were uh, likely to um, support the government rather than to be against it. In those days, we hadn't really established the principle 
Um, it came, that came uh, a, a very short time later, actually, in an Irish case, that um, only legally qualified persons could sit in the <laughs> House of Lords or Privy Council. <laughs> anyway, be that as it may, um, uh, you've also touched on other uh, more recent things. Uh, you mentioned um, the uh, case of the women in the armed forces uh, whose um, um, one of the arguments in favor of the current the law which you held um, illegitimate was that there were no separate toilets. Uh, I'm afraid in this country too, it, it, the commercial bar in the 1970s when I uh, had just joined it used to arbitrate on the Baltic, um, in the Baltic Exchange, which was subsequently blown up, actually. Uh, but um, in order to get to the rooms and the way you arbitrated, and indeed the lunch, probably the most important thing in those days, was um, you had to walk across the floor of the Baltic, which women were not allowed to do. So it was said that there could be no woman barrister at the commercial law, and there was. There wasn't. There wasn't any. It took a, took a few years before that um, prejudice um, evaporated. and. Uh, uh, what you've shown is how the Supreme Court has been um, so valuable in sweeping away um, judgments based on stereotypical approaches uh, and on a coolly analytical approach where there is no harm to others, uh, where there's no rational justification ultimately when you think it through, except some sort of majoritarian history, historical or patriarchal uh, preconception. Uh, you touched at the very end, very interestingly, I thought, on the um, death penalty cases and the psychological evaluation of a convict. Again, I'm proud to say that, um, I mean, uh, the Privy Council's uh, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council's history is um, um, littered with the U-turns. Uh, originally, it said, um, sorry, and this was not long ago, I mean, 30 years ago, it said, um, sorry, any judgment about whether to um, uh, commute the death penalty, death penalty is a matter for the prerogative role, prerogative, which now uh, inheres probably to the local president of his overseas jurisdiction or head of state, and we can't evaluate it at all. Well, uh, happily, we um, uh, abandoned that attitude to the um, executive decisions a long time, uh, uh, 25 years or so ago, in the civil service unions case, and happily, the Privy Council in death penalty cases, which it still has to consider, although the death penalty in practice is never executed in um, the overseas jurisdictions which it deals with, but happily, the Privy Council held that um, um, it could review the um, executive decision whether to commute a death penalty, and in particular, it could review it on exactly the ground you mentioned, namely that the, the psychological evaluation indicated that this person was really not someone who had understood either probably what they were doing originally or certainly what was about to happen to them and so on. And it was uh, inhuman to um, uh, execute. But I've spoken enough. We're, we're all deeply indebted to you for extraordinarily fascinating talk, which we'll look forward to very much indeed to reading. To reading. And I know there are others here who are uh, extremely interested and actually very dedicated to the sum of the subjects you mentioned, we all want to ask you lots of questions. Thank you once again so much, Justice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much once again for an uh, extraordinarily uh, magisterial overview of you know, how the judiciary has made the Constitution come alive uh, to support the rights of highly marginalized groups of, um, of Indian society. Um, so I guess you know, we've had a, quite a substantial online presence as well with many questions which are just flowing through, but I wanted uh, colleagues in the room an opportunity to pose uh, a set of questions to you, and if you don't mind, we'll collect a few at a time. Um, so. The floor is now open uh, to you. Um, yes, please introduce yourself and keep your question pretty brief. Yeah, uh, so Marcia, thank you for the insightful comments. My name is Shahab, I'm a PhD student at King's. So, um, looking at what you discussed and how things are working in India, it appears that almost all the groups are protected except Muslims. And. Um, the role of courts in a democracy, so there is a judgment, actually there are some judgments, in which the Supreme Court judge, Justice Gogoi, 
called categorically Muslims as vultures, Muslim immigrants as vultures and army of ants. So these are the words of the judgment. And then there are judgments of Karnata High Court in which Muslim hijab, uh, uh, hijab ban is placed on Muslim women. So w w how do you view the role of courts in regard to the group of Muslim minorities in India? Or uh, how, how, what's the future of that? Thank you. Well, uh, can I ask that, or uh, do we take another? Uh, yeah, just two more. Sure, sure. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Alpa Shah, Professor of Anthropology at the London School of Economics. Thank you for being who you are. Um, uh, you know, dissent as a safety valve of democracy is something that we all kind of hold by as words from you that have given us hope. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about where you ended, um, about the fulfillment of the ideas of the Constitution, which can't just be exercised, you know, just once every five years and the, the role of the citizenry um, uh, in, 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 in engaging and in deliberating, uh, and that, of course, the burden should not be on just the Supreme Court. Um, but what happens in a context where uh, that space for deliberation, for uh, the fight for democracy on the ground, has been uh, so um, persecuted, uh, Right, uh, with so many of our colleagues and friends who are fighting on the ground in, in prison. Uh, where do we go next? I mean, where, where, where do you see hope? I mean, of course, the Supreme Court is, is, is the obvious place uh, to go to, but where else do you see the fight? Where else do we see we ought to be going to? What's the role of the international community? Um, perhaps if you could address some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is related to the first question that was asked. I think you, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. I think you touched upon caste, women rights, gender rights in general, uh, disability, convicts. I think what in recent times, which I think uh, you did not touch upon was, uh, uh, was some, what someone asked earlier was Muslims or religion in general. And in that context, I had two uh, recent instances where habeas corpus petitions were lying in the Supreme Court for months and even years in the context of uh, removal of Article 370 in, in Jammu and Kashmir. And more recently, bulldozers have been used on Muslim homes without any judici judicial intervention. So uh, uh, it would be uh, great if uh, you could comment on that from what the court feels about it. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. All right. Um, let me do, deal with some of the common elements in all the three questions. Uh, being a judge uh, imposes some restraints on me in the sense that where there's an issue which is live and which is pending either before my court individually or before another bench of my court, uh, by virtue of the restraints of my office, I can't discuss that case. Uh, it would be improper for me to, uh, to do so. But uh, let me begin by telling you this. Uh, let me look at the broader issue which you first framed, which I'd like to address, uh, which is that this perception that uh, the jurisprudence of the court does not deal with a particular religion, in this case, the, uh, the, the Muslims. I think this is not a very fair, it's not a fair assessment of the work of the Supreme Court. Uh, what happens is that uh, very often uh, the media or social media does not highlight necessarily individual cases which come up before us almost with routine regularity, but which do not provide any fodder to the media because these are cases where courts deal with cases involving communities, groups of citizens, whether they belong to the marginalized communities or on the political fringe or away from the mainstream, courts do render justice in those individual cases. Unfortunately, they're never reported in the media. And that I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, whether it be in the context of the freedom of religion. For instance, uh, you have, apart from Article 25, Article 26, 25 guarantees the individual right to the freedom of religion. 26 speaks about the rights of religious denominations. 
Then you have Article 29, which and Article 30, uh, the right to set up educational institutions of your choice. If you look at the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court, for instance, dealing with linguistic or religious minorities and their right to set up, to, uh, to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice, there's vibrant jurisprudence, which is continuing jurisprudence by the Supreme Court, where rights specifically, not only of linguistic minorities, but rights of religious minorities, including and not confined only to the Muslims, has been uh, consistently upheld by our, by our Supreme Court. Uh, therefore, when you look at you know, the overall perception that you have spoken of, of the Supreme Court's engagement, I must tell you that what you necessarily read on the media or the social media is not, I believe, a correct statement of what happens in the day-to-day -day life of every judicial institution in the country. You will have small <coughs> cases. In fact, one of the criticisms of the Supreme Court is, why do you deal with so many small cases? You should, like the American Supreme Court or maybe many of the other Supreme Courts across the world, be dealing with only the issues of constitutional philosophy or constitutional policy. That's not the way our Constitution has framed our role. And to be very honest, I mean, writing a judgment in a very important constitutional issue gives undiluted pleasure to a judge because that's where your intellectual capacities are stretched to their limit. But the real cases which give you the greatest amount of satisfaction of the judge is when you deal with individual problems. Somebody who has been dishoused, somebody whose pension has not been paid, somebody who has not been allowed to uh, avail of some basic civic amenity. And these are the small cases which come to us involving a cross-section of communities, including, of course, the Muslims. And if you look at the broader context of the work which the High Courts and the Supreme Court do, which unfortunately does not find notice in the media, and I don't blame the media for it because it's not newsworthy. It's simply not newsworthy because the court has done justice. Uh, and because you've done justice and you've brought some sort of solace to a, or to a common citizen, never makes its way into the pages. Uh, you've spoken of, uh, sir, about the, uh, the hijab issue. I wouldn't like to answer that because that's specifically pending before the Supreme Court. Uh, I only know, of course, as a, as a judge of the court, that it was mentioned for listing and it's likely to be taken up by the, by the Supreme Court, as the learned Chief Justice said. Uh, so you mentioned about the, uh, the demolition of the, uh, some homes in, um, you, you referred to the case involving the demolition at Prayagraj. Uh, it would not be correct to say that the Supreme Court has not taken up the issue. Uh, again, my knowledge is from reading the newspapers just before I left for uh, London. Uh, the vacation bench of the Supreme Court took up the matter on priority when it was mentioned before the Supreme Court for early listing. They have issued notice, which is the first step that the, that the court has to follow, which is you issue notice to the other side, and then once the government in this case or the local authority in this case receives summons from the court, they respond, file an affidavit, and the court deals with the matter. So these are both matters which are live and pending before the Supreme Court. In fact, the, uh, the position is not that the Supreme Court has not taken up the matter, but that the Supreme Court has taken up the matter even during the, or even during the vacation. On the issue of uh, the petition involving Article 370, the habeas the, the, yes, I'll, I'll deal with the habeas corpus in a moment. Uh, the Article 370, that is a matter which has been referred to a constitution bench, that is before the constitution bench. Let me just tell you only one thing. I, I, I don't want to specifically deal with the merits of that case because obviously it is pending before a bench of the Supreme Court, uh, which would be hearing the, uh, the, the constitutional challenge. But uh, the Supreme Court has 34 judges. We have over 35,000 cases which we deal with every year. On every Monday and Friday, every judge of the Supreme Court is reading between 60 to 65 or maybe 70. There have been times when I've read 120 on a Monday. Uh, this is the kind of workload which a Supreme Court judge does. You read about 65 to 70 cases on a Monday and you read 65 to 70 cases for a Friday, which means for a Monday you are putting in about 12 hours of work on a Sunday. For the Friday, you begin reading on Tuesday. On Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, each of us in the court is dealing with at least 20, between 20 and 40 cases where you reserve judgments, go home and start dictating a judgment for next day. Together with this, you are reading also for Friday. The workload on judges of the Supreme Court is enormous. Now, this is, it's an important policy issue. 
should the court really be dealing with this vast majority of cases? And I can share with you, and I, I, I'm sure that I would not really do, be, be uh, sharing something which we as judges do not share between each other, which is, is this really, are we by this huge backlog of cases, this huge inflow of cases which comes to us, are we in that sense not able to deal with some of the more important policy or constitutional issues which come before the court? Now, the vision which the Constitution, the Constitution gave us Article 136 of the Constitution. Now, Article 136 of the Constitution allows us to deal with any case which involves a substantial question of law of general public importance. Very few Supreme Courts across the world have this kind of a provision in the Constitution. As a result of which, we are not just a constitutional court, we are also a court of appeal. So on an average, on a Monday, I'll have 10 bail applications. Now, for all the habeas corpus uh, petitions, you know, I, I'll go to the habeas corpus issue right at the end. These cases never see the light of the day in the, in the media because these are routine cases which the court is handling. They may be routine for the media, but they are of seminal importance for the person to whom bail has not been granted, either by the district court or by the high court. And we look at that jurisdiction extremely carefully. For instance, I'll tell you, uh, the, the, there are courts in India, the Allahabad High Court, for instance, is hearing criminal appeals of 1990. Now, there are convicts who have undergone, there are convicts who have, say, undergone uh, 15 years of actual custody, of actual imprisonment, and whose appeals have not been heard. We have applications for bail of those convicts which come to the Supreme Court, and we have been insisting that if the High Court cannot hear their appeals on an expedited basis simply because of a dearth of infrastructure, it's not that the judges are not there to hear those appeals. There's a dearth of infrastructure. The Allahabad High Court has a sanction strength of 160 judges, but you can't obviously have 160 uh, judges in place. Where do you get those judges from? So when you look at these issues pertaining to India, it's, I think, important to us, uh, for us to understand that part of the issue I mean, which case ought to be heard is again a matter for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to decide, and that allocation is made according to roster to judges. But we must understand the context in which uh, our judges decide cases, and the burden on the, on, on the contemporary judge. I don't think our judges had this sort of a burden in 1950, or 1960, or even for that matter in 2000, and it's not getting, getting easier for us, it's getting only more difficult. What's the solution for this? Do we then say that, well, cut out at certain level small cases involving important issues for individual citizens, or do you continue with this wide sweeping jurisdiction? For instance, some of the cases that I spoke of, if we didn't deal with those cases, we wouldn't be laying down law for the country. Insofar as the habeas corpus petitions are concerned, I must also share with you that, again, cases which never see the light of the day are actual habeas corpus cases which we decide. Uh, it's not that judges are not deciding habeas corpus cases. Critical habeas corpus cases involving detention of citizens, not just for an apprehended violation of economic laws, but on other grounds as well. They come up before the court. They're dealt with by judges, analyzed by judges. Well, one of the common law traditions which we follow is that we have to hear parties. We don't decide cases merely by reading the briefs and going home. We have an oral tradition. There again, is there a scope for reform? Cut down oral arguments so that you have a little more uh, time for yourself to deal with a larger uh, number of cases. Uh, possible uh, changes for reform, which I think would uh, go a long way in assuaging this concern that the court has to ultimately find time in its docket and calendar to deal with cases. But I'm sorry, I've not been able to deal with specific instances in, uh, on hijab or Article 370 but that's pending before the court would not be proper for me to deal with it. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to, you know, the people who have also posted questions online, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, bring them together a little bit. So one of the questions that uh, students have, I think, is about uh, the Babri Masjid decision in particular, uh, particularly whether majoritarian mythological claims can be grounds to pass judgments on title suits. Um, if, if not, then how do you rationalize the judgment in the Babri Masjid case? Uh, so this is, you know, so there's a whole group of questions uh, around that particular decision. Then there's another uh, group of cases, uh, comments which deal with 
the composition of the judiciary and the fact that it's not actually representative of you know, a vast section of uh, Indian society. So the question is, how do you uh, make it more representative? And also where litigants themselves are not able to articulate uh, you know, their rights, uh, their claims on the Constitution, how do you bridge the gap, uh, essentially? And I think tying up with what Alpash has talked about, you know, uh, the criminalization of various forms of protest, there's another set of questions which are asking about the laws on sedition uh, and UAPA and you know, increasingly draconian criminal laws. Uh, that seem to you know, threaten uh, individual liberty. Right. Let me take the first uh, question on the Babri Masjid issue. Uh, I was a part of the bench, and I don't think I would be justified in uh, engaging in a critique on the judgment. I think it's, uh, it's for posterity to decide whether the judgment is correct, whether it is not. It's for the academia to discuss whether the judgment is right or wrong. Whether it is right or wrong is for society to, 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 uh, to decide. It is for uh, scholars to comment on. It's for legal scholars, for historians to speak about. And I don't think uh, it would be appropriate for me to engage in a critique on the judgment of a bench of which I have been a part. Uh, on the issue as to whether there is a need for a greater sense of inclusion, or how do you uh, ensure that there is diversity within the, within the judiciary? Now, this is an issue of, uh, this is an issue of concern. Uh, let me take the first issue, which is really the need to have more women uh, judges on the bench. Uh, as you know, you know the, uh, the, the Indian judiciary has a unified structure, unlike, say, the United States, where you have the state judiciary and you have the federal judiciary. We have one unified structure of the judiciary in the country. You have the district courts, uh, which the district courts fall under the administration of the high courts. Then you have the high courts, and then finally an appeal uh, to, the, uh, to the Supreme Court of India. The recruitment to the district courts is done within the state. You don't have a national recruitment to the district courts. Several states have now provisions for affirmative action for the appointment of women to the, to the district judiciary. But I must share with you something very interesting, that independent of affirmative action for women in the district judiciary, the recruitment of women judges into the district judiciary is almost outstripping, at, at par or outstripping the recruitment of, of, of men. Uh, among the younger generation, you'd find a lot of women are entering the, uh, the, the, the portals of the district judiciary. It may possibly have something to do with the spread of education and access to education in different parts of the country. So for instance, if you look at the more educationally developed states in India, uh, such as Maharashtra, or uh, Karnataka, or Gujarat, or Kerala, or Tamil Nadu, uh, where the, the fruits of education diversified much earlier, uh, you'd find a lot more women have come into the judiciary at the lowest levels, from the district level. Uh, from the district ju uh, judiciary, judges to the high court are recruited, typically, there is a, uh, an informal uh, quota between the district judiciary and bar judges like me who are appointed to the high court. Uh, in so far as the bar judges are concerned, you find that in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the larger metropolitan areas of the uh, country, more and more women lawyers are being recruited. But ultimately, I think it has something to do with the spread of women's education because I do believe the key really in that sense uh, the national law schools, for instance, um, I must share with you that I have, uh, I have five judicial clerks this year, four of them are women, and, uh, and this is really now a continuing pattern. But the national law schools, again, are really a small fraction of the overall uh, supply of lawyers into the system. And what do we do in that sense to ensure that more women come into the, uh, to, to come into the legal profession? The issue is not just about recruiting judges. You have to ensure that the workspace for women is more friendly to women. That the workspace for women, and I think I must share this experience which I had over the pandemic. When the pandemic descended on us, we didn't know what to do. We had the e-courts project in place. We had provided computerization for 18,000 <coughs> courts in India, which I, as chairperson of the e-committee, I'm looking after. So we, we had installed video conferencing equipment in every court to connect the courts with the jails to obviate the, trans, the transport of prisoners on a daily basis between the jails and the courts. We used that video conferencing equipment for having arguments in the court. 
one of the key areas which I found, and this is of relevance to your question on diversity, is that one of the key benefits which we found on, of video conferencing on the increasing use of technology for hearing is that a lot more women began arguing their cases in courts. And one of the reasons, maybe, uh, and that's my assessment, is that women do perform multifold and manifold responsibilities. And for a young woman lawyer who has, say, a young child to look after, uh, it's so much more efficient and productive to be uh, at home, prepared with your brief, and arguing a case. And therefore, I, I, I look at technology as a very great enabler and as a great facilitator for ensuring that uh, the access to uh, courts becomes more democratic in the longer run. There is, as a matter of national policy, an effort to recruit more people uh, from a diverse segment of uh, society, not just women, but people belonging to the minorities or, or people uh, from the scheduled caste. There is, an, there is an, a clear-cut policy in place. I know, as a matter of fact, I've been a chief justice of a high court for three years. And when you make recommendations for appointment of judges, as you know, recommendations for appointment of judges emanate from the judiciary. And then there is a political input from the executive arm of the state as well. A very concerted effort is made to uh, diversify your uh, recruitment to the judiciary. But by and by, I think things are changing for the simple reason that more and more women at least are entering the, are entering the uh, judiciary at the level of the district courts. The bar, it all depends on how we encourage diverse segments of society and perhaps redefine some of our standards for recruitment to the higher, for the higher judiciary. For instance, uh, we have uh, standards of income. Uh, you should broadly have a certain income before you are recruited as a judge of the high court. Now, should those standards, say, of income be relaxed for people uh, who are appearing not necessarily for well-paid clients, somebody who is doing labor work or somebody who is taking up gender issues, may not be a very highly paid lawyer, but should the assessment of those people be made differently? If you are recruiting a commercial lawyer, obviously that lawyer is going to be very highly paid, very highly successful, uh, applying the conventional yardsticks of success in the legal profession. But speaking for myself, if we have to uh, diversify the Indian judiciary, Perhaps we have to redefine the standards which we apply at the very threshold for, for recruitment, uh, particularly at the level of the high courts. Thank you. Do we have time for one more round of questions? Yes, very quickly. So I think Kriti, Rajkumar, and Rob, keep it really short. Thank you for that uh, magisterial talk, as Prabha called it uh, rightly. My uh, question comes from, uh, obviously, a, very, a deep admiration for your dissenting vote on, uh, in the Puttaswami case. And while you uh, spoke very, uh, I guess, in very positive terms about the potential of the technological revolution uh, in, judiciary, in the judiciary, I would have, uh, could you say a little bit more on um, the, rec the, you know, the future of technology and especially in relation to when it starts to curtail civil liberties, uh, and especially not in terms, not necessarily, I'm not interested that much in regulating big tech, but the state. All right, um, well, thank you very much for that uh, really comprehensive 24 on. Thank you very much for that really comprehensive 24 on issues surrounding human rights and civil liberties and its contemporary context in India. Uh, I want to take you back to where you started with, you mentioned about Ambedkar. And one of the last, in fact, the last speeches of Ambedkar in the Constant Assembly, uh, he was conscious of the fact that we had this, created this constitution and we expect it to work, but he was also extremely conscious of what he possibly predicted the evolution of uh, what he calls as uh, abandoning of bloody revolution and the grammar of anarchy. Uh, in a way, what I want you to reflect upon is that the, these huge expectations that are generated out of the court itself in dealing with these issues that we talked about, is this something that has the potential to be not manageable? 
in the sense that the court is constantly sought out for issues that clearly other branches of government, A, ought to be doing or possibly failing. And in that process, the court is at best trying to respond to these issues, but inevitably will be having some issues not adequately dealt with to the satisfaction of the victims, the people who are approaching the court. In a way, is there, a, is there a, uh, an opportunity for us to revisit the grammar of anarchy fear that Ambedkar talked about, that we need to invest in constitutional methods and we need to have greater trust on institutions so that we can you know, deal with these issues in a better manner. No? Uh, Robert Winston, professor of human rights law here at King's. Uh, I first did have, uh, had the chance to visit India. Thanks. First had the chance to visit India in 2006, and I followed the um, Section 377 case for 12 years until 2018, and had the great pleasure of reading uh, your opinion uh, in that case. Um, that's just a comment. My question is a follow-up to the question of workload. Um, and as a foreign observer, um, well, I visited the Supreme Court of India once, and it's uh, very striking that it's a buzzing place with hundreds of lawyers in the corridors, many cases going on at the same time. And um, so the two I ideas I've had with regard to redistributing your workload are one, uh, whether original jurisdiction should be abolished or restricted because it's much wider than in most for most highest courts. Uh, and also what, for a foreign observer, what seems to be missing in the Indian court system is courts of appeal. So I think some consideration will be given to creating intermediate courts of appeal between the high courts and, um, and the Supreme Court. Perhaps I'm just thinking out, thinking, dear, well, I, 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 just a minute ago I thought, well, how about one per hundred million people? It would be a tricky question of whether it's one per state and you have smaller states, etc but um, perhaps 10 to 15 uh, intermediate courts of appeal. And that way, when cases reach the Supreme Court, they would already have been considered by an appellate court. And then perhaps the Supreme Court of India would have the luxury of choosing cases that uh, required more attention. Uh, I'll take the first question on uh, technology and the, and the big state. Uh, actually, my dissent was in Aadhaar, not in Puttuswami. Puttuswami was the case on uh, privacy, where I, I wrote the, uh, the, the, the plurality opinion for, uh, for four judges. Aadhaar is the biometric project of the uh, government of India where I dissented. Uh, well, uh, you know, technology is a, great, is a great facilitator, it's a great enabler. If you look at the problems which confront the Indian judiciary about case management, uh, probably technology, I mean, uh, particularly because my engagement with technology in the last uh, several years, technology is a very clear answer for us because that is really the key to more efficient management. But obviously there is a flip side of uh, technology. For instance, we have the National Judicial Data Grid, which uh, I, I'm sure uh, some of you would like to just surf and uh, key in the words National Judicial Data Grid, and you'll see the kind of fascinating data that you have on that. Now, the National Judicial Data Grid houses every conceivable order that is passed by a court in India uh, on the grid. Uh, some of our courts don't have electricity for six hours in the day, but before the end of the day, every part of the data is uploaded onto the National Judicial Data Grid. Now, it does raise an issue of privacy, of security because we are dealing with personal and sensitive details of, uh, of individuals. Uh, we are looking at that very carefully by setting up a data and uh, privacy security committee in the e-committee of the Supreme Court of India. How do you balance this? I mean, you need that data grid because that's now the framework for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, second, I'll give you another example. Uh, we have in place what is called the interoperable criminal justice system. Uh, which would ensure that the moment that a first information report is filed in a police station across India, it is mapped onto the system. Uh, one of the problems which we face in criminal appeals is 
that if I have to hear a criminal appeal, say, against a judgment originating in one high court in India, it would take several months for the record to be translated and to be sent in the physical form to the Supreme Court. And the convict would, unless granted bail, be languishing in jail. Now, much of the technological intervention which we now envisage would obviate these delays in the process. But there is obviously a concern that when everybody is mapped onto one grid and technology then takes over, then a lot of details which otherwise would be personal would emerge in that grid. Uh, we have some clear uh, gold standards, for instance, cases relating to child sexual abuse. These will not be on the grid. Cases involving matrimonial disputes, we deal with very personal and intimate details of the relationship of a couple, ought not to be on the, on, ought not to be on the grid. But what about other cases, commercial secrets or commercial, uh, commercial uh, issues? Should this be on the grid or not be on the grid? So I'm not sure we have easy answers. And this is not just a problem which we are confronting in India. I think societies across the world uh, are confronting this uh, issue of where do you draw the balance between the efficiency of technology and the dangers of, uh, of technology. For speaking for myself, for instance, we can use artificial intelligence, but I would be very reluctant to use artificial intelligence to guide judges and sentencing policy. Because it's now a documented fact that when you use AI for sentencing policy, it disproportionately impacts upon, say, uh, minorities. It disproportionately tends to impact because this software, AI, is devised by people who have a different norm and uh, therefore it disproportionately impacts uh, uh, people who would be vulnerable. So this is an issue which I don't think I have an answer. Uh, societies across the world are confronting this. Um, the, uh, the second issue which uh, Raj raised, which was uh, on uh, what Dr. Ambedkar uh, spoke of in terms of the grammar of anarchy. And Raj, your question was as to uh, what do you do through this that everything is landing up uh, in courts? Now, when we, for instance, uh, one of the criticisms which is leveled against uh, courts is that you are taking over policy. Now, every time the court interferes in a very sensitive issue of, say, environmental law, or, uh, or, or for that matter, even economic law. The attack on the court is, well, you're taking over issues of policy which are not part of your domain. Speaking for myself, the line is very clear, at least as a matter of abstract doctrine, that what a policy should be is not for the court to decide. You have to entrust it to the elected arms of government. And that's what a democracy is all about. Uh, you may not like the policy, but you have to accept the fact that the Constitution has trusted governance to an elected arm of government. Where the court has to interfere is where you find that the policy is unconstitutional. Now, sometimes, as, as judges, as we, we know as judges, the dividing line may be very clear in abstract doctrine. It becomes a little more blurred when you actually start deciding cases. So that trying to define the limits of policy and trying to define the limits of constitutionality is not exactly as straightforward as it appeared as it, as it would appear in academic discourse. So these are obviously issues which judges have to decide on a case to case uh, on a case to case basis. Uh, the third uh, the third issue really on uh, redistribution of the workload of the court by possibly uh, abolishing the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and by envisaging courts of appeal. The problem about the workload of the Supreme Court is not so much because of the original jurisdiction. Though we have an original jurisdiction, the high courts have a much broader original jurisdiction. The original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in Article 32 is confined only to a violation of fundamental rights, the rights in Part 3 of the Constitution. The original jurisdiction of our state high courts is much wider than our jurisdiction. Uh, therefore, I think that the Constitution very uh, designedly has given the Supreme Court original jurisdiction to at least have that as a court of last resort, as the ultimate arbiter, the ultimate guarantee for the protection of the fundamental rights. So speaking for myself, both as a judge, as a lawyer who has practiced for long years, and who has, uh, I've also taught in universities, I would be very averse to any proposal by virtue of which the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is sought to be curtailed. 
Having said that, we as judges do know, for instance, you know, when we would, for instance, send a litigant to the High Court. We tell a litigant, why have you come here straight? Uh, your case is maintainable before us, but it involves a decision on several areas of fact where you might be better off going to the High Court. And we would persuade the litigant to go to the High Court instead of just sort of uh, uh, throwing the case out, particularly where there's a party in person. On the issue of creating courts of appeal, uh, the, uh, the Attorney General for India, Mr. Venugopal, has been repeatedly uh, stressing this, that one way of reducing the, the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the backlog and burden of appellate jurisdiction, because we, every uh, judgment of a high court in, say, a case involving a conviction for murder or an acquittal of murder comes off in appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, a grant or denial of bail or anticipatory bail comes to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Attorney General, for instance, has been pressing the point that if you were to create Court of Appeals, which, uh, Professor, your, your suggestion was, then the Court can really have the discretion to take a more limited number of cases and to dissolve and resolve only a, 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 a small number of cases on its appellate jurisdiction. But that, again, would require, a, it requires a constitutional amendment. I must tell you something very interesting. One of the reasons why the uh, jurisdiction of the court has also increased is because of special statutes and tribunalization. Increasingly in India, the work of courts has been now handed over to tribunals. So you have in securities law, electricity, consumer law, uh, service disputes involving employees of government, the armed forces tribunal, competition law, you have specialized tribunals which have been created, environmental law, you have the National Green Tribunal. The idea behind the creation of tribunals that you will have was that you will have specialized bodies which, are, which will deal with these disputes. What Parliament has done in the process is, in many cases, an appeal lies directly to the Supreme Court from the judgment of the tribunal. So every day, for instance, I would be hearing appeals from judgments of the National Green Tribunal or the National Consumer Disputes Tribunal or the Securities Appellate Tribunal. Uh, the reason why Parliament did that was to provide an efficacious and quick remedy of an appeal to the Supreme Court. The flip side is that you're burdening the Supreme Court with this whole host of first appeals, which come in appeal for the first time against the decision of the tribunal, where you have to apply your mind very carefully uh, to even the facts, because this is the first appeal that a litigant has got uh, by filing an appeal in the Supreme Court. Uh, would it be appropriate to take away that jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and give the High Court's jurisdiction to hear cases involving the tribunals? Again, that's a possible way to declog the Supreme Court. Uh, much of our jurisdiction is because of the specialized uh, tribunals which have come up now in the country uh, against whose decisions uh, Parliament has envisaged that appeals lie straight to us. And many of those are uh, extremely complex disputes, for instance, electricity disputes, a very, very complex area of law where you really need to understand the, tec the technical aspects of the subject and where a lot more time is spent by the Supreme Court in hearing those uh, cases. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think now um, I'll hand you to... very little remains for me to say because uh, we've had a, a fascinating uh, exposure which has been supplemented by some very interesting questions, uh, some of which obviously show uh, considerable audience knowledge of the scene in India and how closely it's followed uh, over here is an interesting uh, discovery. Uh, thank you again, Justice Chandra Chud, uh, for wonderful um, uh, willingness to engage in every question except, of course, the ones where you are judicially engaged, where we quite understand why uh, that um, can't be so. So, thank you very much. Thank you.